Hello, Arno. Hey. So it looks like there are only two of us so far. The show must go on. Yes. Je vais fermer la porte. J'ai une aide. J'ai une aide. Courage. I have. That's my help. I see. That's good. That's good. I'm allergic for kids, actually. <laughs> So, I'm wondering if people can see us right now. Uh, that's a good question, actually. Maybe we can ask. We can see you. Good. So, <laughs> can you hear us? I'm starting to share my screen. Can you can you see my screen now? Yes. Yeah. So I see. I think we. I think. I think we can wait for a couple of minutes, right? Yes. We have three minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It looks like we are all set. I'm getting it back. Good afternoon. So it looks like time to start. Oh no, you are on mute so far. Just, just in case. Just in case. So let's let, let's get started slowly, right? It's half past half past four CET. So I think it's the right time to start. Uh, so welcome everyone for our to our GraphQL API session. We're going to spend next 
right. Uh, hope you can see us well, hear us well, and see my screen as well. Uh, and next, for next 45 minutes, we're going to talk about GraphQL, its advantages, challenges, as well as to, to show a demo on how API management platform called API Connect can be used to manage and secure GraphQL APIs. Um, let, let me switch to my PowerPoint. Yeah. First of all, we would like to briefly introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is Ivan Pranichnikov. I'm part of uh, European integration team at, at IBM. Uh, so I'm working with our key clients across, across Europe and help, helping them to modernize their to build, design, and modernize their integration uh, architectures. And I am primarily focused on API management, so working a lot around and with API management platforms and, we, and with API management uh, pro projects. Uh, I've been working with GraphQL for a couple of years so far uh, and got really excited and enthusiastic when IBM announced native support for GraphQL in IBM API Connect in our API management platform. And I immediately started to, to experiment with it, to build some use cases and scenarios with it. And apparently it turned out that Arno, who is my fellow colleague from France, that Arno also started to do the same independently. And therefore we decided to team for this workshop, workshop together. Arno, would you, would you maybe introduce yourself as well? Please. Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Arne Depré. I'm interested in security, data power, API Connect, and GraphQL, as you can see on the icon. I have been uh, 25 years in uh, IBM, working in the integration space, uh, first with uh, WebSphere and, uh, and then with on a service-oriented architecture, and now on API. This is a normal journey and uh, enjoy every single step of it. So you can start, Ivan. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Arna. Uh, so our session has limited time, uh, so we decided to split it into two sections. Uh, the first block will be a theory. It, it won't be too long, right? I just want going to give you a short overview of, of what GraphQL is. I'm sure that all of us understand what it is, but to be sure we are all on the same page. Uh, then we'll talk a bit about its advantages and challenges and trade-offs, uh, about advantages and challenges in terms of security, in terms of rate limits, and so on and so forth. And then I'll say a couple of things around what IBM is doing in order to help you protecting and managing GraphQL endpoints, GraphQL interfaces. And then I'll over to Arno so he can uh, show it to you live how IBM API Connect can be managed to secure and to expose GraphQL interfaces using the same practices as for REST interfaces, basically. And then I hope we have some time for the Q&A after the, the demonstration. Uh, so let me start from a short recap of what GraphQL is. Basically, uh, GraphQL is a query language for APIs. It was developed around mm, around eight years ago in Facebook. The time flies, actually. Uh, eight years ago in, 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 in Facebook, and it's getting quite popular. Uh, two years ago, a bit more than two years ago, uh, the Linux Foundation has announced the GraphQL Foundation initiative. And basically, GraphQL gives clients the power to ask for exactly what they need from the server and use, and instead of traditional REST calls, to use queries to get all the required data in at once, instead of using tens or, in certain cases, maybe even hundreds or thousands of IBM calls. And I can say that IBM is pleased to be an active member of the Linux Foundation's GraphQL project by participating on its technical working group as well as as a founding member of its governing board. We have, all, we have already made numerous of contributions to the GraphQL initiative. Uh, for example, we have developed and released an open source library called OpenAPI to GraphQL, which allows to generate GraphQL interfaces, easily to generate GraphQL interfaces on top of existing REST APIs. So we, are, we, are, we like GraphQL and we are developing our products and we are adding support for GraphQL into our products. Uh, and 
we are doing it because we believe that GraphQL is a great tool and is a great thing. And by the way, this tool is getting more and more popular these days. Uh, if we go to landscape.graphql.org, we will see lots of, let me say, modern or digital, digital companies or startups using GraphQL already. However, from what I see working with IBM clients across Europe and working with IBM clients from different industries, from different markets across Europe, traditional companies from traditional industries, such as banks, such as retailers, such as telcos and others, they are also starting to adopt GraphQL quite actively these days. So they're starting to invest and they're starting to, to do some tests, POCs, pilots around GraphQL these days. And it kind of proves by the fact that if we go to the GitHub, to the reference implement, implementation uh, of GraphQL, we can see that number of NPM downloads is nearly doubling year over year. So I took these numbers today and for the week of December 10th to 16, uh, 2019, it has something around 2.3 million downloads. And as of today, as I, again, just to repeat, I took these numbers a bit, a couple of hours back today. Uh, as of today, it has more than 4.5 million downloads as of week from December 1 to December 7th. So it's definitely getting popular. But you may want to ask a question, why is GraphQL getting popular? Uh, I believe it's happening for several reasons, actually. Uh, I believe it's happening because GraphQL gives uh, a certain advantages to, to clients, right, and certain advantages to API consumers and to API providers. Uh, first of all, it allows to reduce number of requests as well as to reduce the network traffic. Uh, it allows clients to get from the server uh, just what they need easier and actually faster. And thanks to my fellow US colleagues for this slide, as we can see from this particular example, GraphQL allows to significantly, significantly reduce number of calls. For this particular example, we managed to reduce number of calls from 24 to 2, as well as helps to reduce the network traffic for getting, for retrieving the same information from the server. So it gives certain advantages in terms of performance, in terms of speed, and in terms of usability yeah, for the end clients. However, as they say, with great power comes great responsibility, and GraphQL is not an exception in this regard. Along with many advantages, it also brings and introduces new trade-offs and challenges. And if we want to use GraphQL in effectively in our companies, we definitely have to learn how to work with GraphQL properly, how to mitigate risks that GraphQL brings, and how to use its advantage properly and how to avoid its disadvantage properly, how to mitigate risks of, of the disadvantage that GraphQL uh, introduced. Uh, so let's have a quick look on some good and bad sides of, of GraphQL. Advantages are on the left, challenges are on the right, as you probably understand. So GraphQL, as mentioned, GraphQL is very powerful in terms of what I can retrieve using just single uh, request to the server. Uh, it's much more powerful than a simple REST or API call. Uh, for example, one GraphQL query can easily have the server-side cost, the server-side effect, similar to 1,000 or 10,000 of regular uh, REST API calls. Uh, GraphQL interface uh, is a single endpoint where the body, not the operation, where the body determines the action and the body determines how the Mm, server would process the query. Uh, it can be a, a read query where you are getting, for example, profile information from the server, or it can be a create query or mutation in terms of GraphQL that allows us to modify data in your system, that allows us to write something new, to write new data to your system. And hence, considering GraphQL query can be quite different in terms of complexity, right? Traditional rate limiting doesn't really help 
for GraphQL endpoints, and it, they, they don't really work properly for GraphQL queries. Because traditional rate limiting doesn't un, does not understand the cost of a query. Uh, it just understands the count of the calls to, to, to our endpoint, right? And we need to understand the impact of a single GraphQL query on the backend infrastructure. Because as we already discussed, one GraphQL query can be in terms of server side cost and can be similar to 1000 REST calls, for example. Uh, therefore, in the traditional REST use case, a single transaction had a single impact on the compute of backend services. Furthermore, this impact, it could be pre-calculated because the server contract, because the client and the server, it was well-defined. In GraphQL, we don't have that one-to-one -one relationship anymore. Instead, we need to find a way to map, to somehow map compute time to GraphQL calls effectively. And rate limit is, is just one of the examples, actually. There are other challenges that GraphQL brings as well around security, around authentication, around introspection, around GraphQL schema, and so on and so forth. Considering these challenges and difficulties that definitely exist and that definitely should be considered when using GraphQL. You may think and you may ask a question, should I use GraphQL at all? If it's that com complex and if it brings uh, certain disadvantages, maybe I can just ignore its benefits, right? It's uh, benefits in terms of network, benefits in terms of speed, benefits in terms of number of requests. Maybe I can just ignore them and continue using traditional REST or maybe even solve APIs, that is the same way I'm using it today. So maybe I should ignore GraphQL at all. So if, if answering questions, should I use GraphQL at all? I still tend to say, yes, you should in certain cases, right? It's not a, it's not a silver bullet, of course, but in certain cases, and I tend to say yes, but be sure to consider GraphQL trade-offs and properly mitigate mitigate risks that GraphQL brings. And as I said earlier, GraphQL is a nice thing for certain use cases, right? But it's not a silver bullet and it was designed with known trade-offs. So we have to learn how to work with these trade-offs properly. And these trade-offs, they might be acceptable and not that critical when using GraphQL interfaces internally within our company. Because in such case, we know who our clients are and we can in some cases we can even to a certain extent control our clients but imagine what happens once we start exposing graphql endpoints graphql interfaces externally the number of api consumers is starting to grow and we don't know our consumers anymore neither we can control them anymore right we we, we can't influence them anymore and that's why proper security, proper rate limiting, and proper, yeah, proper security and proper rate limiting for GraphQL endpoints is getting a cornerstone when starting to expose GraphQL interfaces outside of the organization. Uh, in GraphQL, as was stated in one of my previous slides, in, in, in GraphQL, the client is always right, right? But for sure, we don't want those clients to downfall or to to, to break our backends, even if they're right. And that's why proper security and that's why proper governance models are really required when using GraphQL interfaces externally, but probably certain models are also required if using gra GraphQL interfaces, even using GraphQL interfaces for partners or even uh, internally for within the enterprise. And we at IBM, we are actively working to help you managing GraphQL interfaces effectively and securely. Uh, for example, IBM Research has invented and introduced a new type of rate limiting approach that incorporates the cost of running a query. So with our API management platform called IBM API Connect, now you can effectively configure, let me call them native GraphQL friendly limits. Uh, moreover, API Connect can introspect GraphQL from an endpoint, look for possible vulnerabilities, and suggest improvements to decrease GraphQL risks when exposing GraphQL interfaces outside of organization. And it also allows to delete types from the schema to ensure no probing requests go through, your, go through the API request from the client to your GraphQL server. But again, as I say, um, 
picture wars, a thousand of words. So let me now over to Arno so that, so that he can show GraphQL API management live based on IBM API Connect. Let me stop sharing yeah. my screen, Arno. Yeah, it's all yours now. Thank you, Ivan. All right, so I'm going to try to share my screen. Uh, I have a small problem. Okay, good. Good, good, good. So let's start with some uh, sample. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the endpoint. Can you see my screen correctly? You see my uh, web browser empty right now? It's good. So I'm going to go to a GraphQL endpoint. This is a, an implementation of a GraphQL API. And this API is, uh, in fact, uh, running in an Apollo implementation. But that's not our main concern right now. But let's go there. If I go to this endpoint, I start to see what we call the graphic uh, query language uh, editor, which allows us to test and query uh, the GraphQL API. The very nice thing about uh, Graph, GraphQL is that we have all the documentation available and we can test it very easily. Like Ivan was saying, we are the, uh, the client is the king. I would add that the server is the prince in the sense that he knows how to get the data and will give you, using a schema, what you can do. What we see here on this uh, GraphQL API, uh, we, we can do queries, a query just to fetch data. We can see we can perform mutation Mutation are the uh, create, update, delete operation. And there is one type which is missing uh, on this server, and that's the subscription. A subscription in a, is a way to get real-time information, and it's based on WebSocket technology usually. OK, so we have the documentation. We can see what we can get. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to try to invoke this API because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a developer. So it's going to be difficult to illustrate here, but what I'm doing here, I'm just typing a few characters. And when I ask for auto completion, it provides me directly what I can get. So here, as described in the documentation, I can get. Uh, account information, account information. And what information do I want? Again, we propose uh, uh, with type ahead enable, I can choose ID. And that's what I'm going to invoke. Very good. So as you can see, it was very easy to invoke this GraphQL API. So far, so good. So now we are going to say, OK, but just one ID is not sufficient, and I need to have more than one ID. OK, so I'm going to start to introduce the notion of limit. And in fact, I'm going to, I want to get 10 information. And that's what it does. I, I ask for 10 accounts ID. And he gave it to me. Very good. So now, by the way, I want to have more information like the name. And again, with type ahead, it's very easy to, to, uh, to know what is needed. Very good. I'm just going to prettify this, and I can get exactly what I want. So far, so good. But now, let's do that, and let's put 1,000. Well, it works. And I guess, guess what? 1,000 information. That starts to be a little bit scary, especially 
because now I'm going to ask for credit card information. And I'm going to ask for the PIN number. So in one query, a very simple query, I've asked all the PIN numbers of all these uh, people information and, and accounts information. And now let's say I have another element and I also have a limit. It's just a fake here and I have 1000. So now with this query, let's put, I'm not, it's not going to work of course, just to illustrate. I'm going to get 1 million information sets. So, wow, that was, that was nice. It was easy to do and easy to get 1 million data. Okay, so we, we start to see that uh, I, like, I like GraphQL. It's very easy for the client, but uh, it raises some challenges. So what we are going to do now is to see how we can protect this GraphQL API with API Connect. Okay, so you are going to see it's very easy. Just going to take the GraphQL endpoint. I'm going to API Connect now. Sorry. And I'm going to create a GraphQL API. And as explained by Ivan, we are going to start to add protection. So I come here. I'm going to add a new API. And it's a GraphQL proxy. So you understand how we don't provide the information. We call the backend. We are going to govern the API. We are going to add more security. So I'm going to call it GraphQL account API. And I'm going to put the GraphQL endpoint. And because this is related to account information, I'm going to call the schema name account. So now I have a screen which provides me a few information. So I don't, I'm going to make it bigger. So here I can see there are some warnings and we will come back to that. So the schema provided by the backend contains some information which API Connect raised some issues. And also we see a few choices in order to decide if I want to enable the GraphQL editor, if I want to start an expose introspection, and also if I want to expose a new endpoint, which is a slash cost, which allow to uh, find the cost of a query so we can better protect the backend and protect the data provided by the GraphQL uh, API server. So here, I'm just going to click next, and we will come back to that. So I'm done. I have this new API, and I'm, we are going to review this API. So as usual, we find the normal uh, settings based on the Open API specification. Uh, the documentation of the API, uh, the security, the path of the API. And you can see here, unlike REST API, where usually we have lots of endpoint and lots of verb, I just have two verbs, here, two operations, the GraphQL, because in fact, we are going to use the schema and the payload uh, to get what we want. So. I'm not going to go further on this screen. This is a normal API uh, definition uh, required. As with any API in API Connect, you can see the, uh, the source of the API. And we see here that we have uh, open API v2. And very soon, we are going to have API v3 just uh, as a side information. So what's happened when we uh, created this API is that API Connect started to implement a complete uh, flow with several operations and several processing based on the API. What you have to remember is that here, uh, why we did that, it's because we want to provide 
further um, configuration if needed. In most of the cases, it's not required, but it's very easy to add any other actions that you would like to do in your processing. So it's a model-driven approach, but customizable. So that's what we see here, and um, that's what is done under the cover. I'm not going to go in detail for lack of time uh, for each operation, but all of those are uh, either the normal invocation or are related to the introspection. So now let's go to the GraphQL schema editor. What we discussed uh, briefly earlier on is that we have tried to find a way to protect those very large, large um, API requests. And one way to do that, uh, and, and of course, using the traditional number of requests per uh, some uh, period of time was not enough, okay? Because we have only one request here. So what we have uh, come up with is a, a way to better describe the query and provide a uh, a, a large amount of configuration for each field okay so and that's what you see here and in fact what we do is we allocate some weight weight for each type for each field in the query in order to be able to calculate a cost for the query when you design this and when you implement uh, this uh, schema augmentation because indeed we augment the schema is uh, that it must be done uh, with the people who are implementing the backend because they will know if a request needs to go to an external server maybe it costs money maybe it's just a field local to the server and it's very easy to get so they will provide you the uh, right information in order to decide what is the right type. Uh, another, uh, one, one, another thing is, uh, so like we said, we have a few warning here. And why is those warning? It's because uh, in order to calculate the, um, the cost of the query, especially when we have relationships between the objects, we need to provide some uh, size information, what we call slicing. So how many of those uh, types do you get normally? Okay, so we have uh, the right size and I will come back in more detail. So what I'm gonna, what we see here is that the slicing argument here is not uh, correctly uh, informed and we are gonna need to provide some more information in order to do the calculation. Like here we see it's unbound list. For uh, lack of simplicity, I'm just gonna apply all here, and that's what it's gonna do, and change the schema uh, with those recommendations. So now we have no more warnings. I'm just gonna save that. Uh, so we have here the types and each field that are available. Another thing we want to do, as you remember, uh, before in the demonstration, we saw that a credit card had very sensitive information. And I don't want to expose the PIN number for this API. Maybe it's used internally, but... Um, we are here, uh, we want to remove the pin because we are gonna expose this, uh, this API externally. So I'm just gonna remove this field because I don't want this field to be accessible uh, externally. So I've just changed the schema. In fact, we start to govern the schema in order to uh, uh, prevent security uh, breach. So what we have now, and let me show you the source, is we have uh, this uh, schema, and I'm just going to do that because I'm going to use another tool here. So I'm going to use GraphQL Voyager. This tool is not IBM, it's provided by API Gurus, 
and it's a very nice way to understand the um, relationship between the types. Okay, so I'm going to change the schema and use the one we've used uh, and we are using. Okay, so as you can see here, uh, and the sample I was uh, doing using earlier on, we see the, the accounts type, we have uh, the, the, the table huh, of uh, accounts, the list of the account specification and all the other types. So that's what we have been using so far. This tool is very nice uh, to uh, understand the the data, the data model behind it. Okay. Uh, of course, it can be uh, much more uh, complex. Okay, I'm going to use another one here, and uh, but it's a good idea to understand how the types are uh, uh, related. You see, GitHub here uh, is an interesting one, and we are not going to go through each detail. But you can see the very uh, uh, effectiveness of these tools. Anyway, back to API Connect here. So we have done two things so far. We have provided additional metadata in order to calculate the cost. We have removed the pin number information because we don't want to expose it. So now I'm going to be able to test it. So that's what I've done. I've put this API online in my uh, development environment, and I can start to use it. So here we found again the GraphQL uh, GraphQL editor, and as before, I can start to query uh, the data from uh, API Connect. So I'm going to do the same uh, same query, and I can get information. Let me uh, make sure I've not done it. <laughs> that the <laughs> You would see my face with a big <laughs> surprise here. Um, that's a nice thing with a live demo. So let me try this thing. Wow. Uh, okay, so let me try to understand why. So it is online. Uh, there was an error message here. Uh, okay. That's embarrassing to the limit. Okay, sorry. Uh, I don't read the, uh, the default error. It's because we have fixed the schema and I'm obliged to put a limit. That's my, uh, my fault, sorry. Okay, so I should have read the error message. <laughs> uh, so what we see here is now we can get the data. And uh, as before, we have, uh, we're able to, uh, to uh, query directly from, um, from uh, API Connect. Okay, so of course now I'm going to make it a little bit more complex. Okay, so as before, I can add uh, stuff. So, so far we have, uh, a mess we have the API exposed uh, by API Connect. We have removed the field. We know the calculation. We can get the calculation and the cost of each query. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start to protect this API. And the way I do that, it's, I'm going to add plan. Okay, and that's what I do here. So the plan is the quota I am going to add 
in order to uh, protect my API. Here, this is a product. I'm going to add this API and I'm going to pro provide a few information about the API, like the visibility. And now I can uh, get this product and show you plans. Okay, so as I said, a plan is a protection based on uh, GraphQL information. Here, I can, def I can provide limit on how I want to, uh, how many types I want to get per hour. So you see, it's not anymore the number of requests, but the, the cost in order in, at the end of the day, the cost of invocation of the GraphQL API in order to protect it. Okay, so here I have put a plan where I just want to really limit the number of calls and limit the size to protect uh, this API. Okay, so I'm just going to put in minutes so we can have something meaningful. And, and that's it. Okay, so this API now has a plan, a, a product and a plan, and I'm going to deploy this product in uh, another environment. Okay, so I, pro I publish this uh, product in a uh, integration environment, and I can now uh, check if it's correctly protected. Okay, so I'm going to go to the uh, portal. All right, I'm going to go to the portal and subscribe to the API and start to use it. So here I'm, I have my consumer, API consumer hat. I see this product, which is a, a, a GraphQL product. I'm going to subscribe to this API with this application. And uh, I can test it directly here. And because we've put a very low number of, of uh, requests and cost. Again, we find the GraphQL editor. We put limit this time, that makes the same mistake. Get the ID. And okay, and as you can see here, straight away it's wrong because i've put 10 you remember we've put 10 maybe i should have tried with one first <laughs> uh, but you see here i cannot anymore require 10 uh, 1000 because i have put a very low limit and what i want to show and i will finish for uh, with that for the question let's go back to the uh, integration catalog where I can see my uh, analytics. So here we have this API, we have remove the pin, we have uh, fix some limit, we have enforced the cost. So what I would like to show you is on how we understand all this information and all this information is also available in the, for, in the analytics part of the product. So here I see straight away, this is a elastic stack as you may have recognized, the 429, which is too many requests. And I can get all this information regarding GraphQL. Okay, so why it's, why it's wrong, what, what is the field cost, the type cost, and um, what, what make it uh, fail at the end of the, uh, of the day. Okay, so we have a full, um, information in order to understand what's happened and we have protected the API. So I'm done because we have five more minutes for questions. I hope you enjoy this demo and sorry for the limit. Uh, too much, too much protection. It worked. <laughs> and uh, um, we are going to open for the question now. So do you have uh, any question? Was it clear? Thanks, Arnaud. I see, I see there was a question whether queries have pageables with a limit head. Yeah, 
I can answer? Yeah. Okay. Uh, 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 this is a very good question. Uh, why? Because indeed, uh, the query language, the GraphQL specification, uh, thought very well about defining how we can paginate. And so there is this notion of offset and also this notion of um, of cursor, okay? And what is very interesting with uh, the GraphQL specification is that they really make a lot of effort to abstract this notion of, uh, of offset and relationship and control the, the number of items, not only for one table, let's say, but also for the relationships and the child of a child, for example, because it, it, it can be quite tricky to define all this. So yes, uh, you can uh, define uh, limits, you can define slices uh, uh, and cursor, you can define max, all this is part of the specification, very powerful and very nicely abstracted in the specification. Yeah, I see. I see there is a question how to deal with subscriptions in the API manager, but I'm not sure I, I understand the question actually. So, subscription for, for APIs, yeah, they, they, they basically use the same way as they, they work the same way as they work for, for REST or SOAP endpoints. So, it's basically the same principle. We just register our credentials, our client ID as a valid. ID to access the endpoint and gateway just verifies it before before letting the request go through the to, to the actual GraphQL backend. So it's pretty much the same principle. Yes. Just one small thing on top of this. As Ivan said, the usual mechanism is based on the client ID. And uh, I must say I'm a big fan of the client ID, but because when we think about service-oriented architecture, it was very hard to find a standard to identify a consumer. Having said that, it is possible to not use a client ID, but you will have to specify what is your identifier in a way. And that's in the flow that I was showing in the assembly where you can do it. There is a question on subscription. We're using WebSocket. So uh, I try to uh, <laughs> not say the truth <laughs> because I said the server was not providing subscription with WebSocket. Uh, there are some uh, graphical implementation which does. Uh, API Connect so far does not support it, but we plan to do it very soon. Very, uh, we will support subscription using WebSocket very quickly. Authorization, do you want to answer, uh, Ivan, or try? Uh, well, you can try, and then, uh, and then I'll continue if needed. <laughs> OK, so authorization, there are two aspects to that. The first is that, as we discuss, uh, we can remove the exposure of some fields. That's the first thing. The second thing is that with the subscription mechanism, like traditional API, there is a, you can uh, provide access to some uh, APIs to uh, either um, authenticated you, uh, consumer or to a restricted uh, set of uh, consumer. I think for the last question, uh, metadata like total self link next page, we have answered it. So the, the, the GraphQL specification are defining the notion of offset and the notion of cursor. And uh, if you want to see that, that's where you have to go. It, you, you will see it's all possible. And um, that's a very powerful and very nice thing that the specs uh, did cover. Yeah. but. Uh but it's, it's it's covered by by the specification actually yes. and we, we, we yes. can conform to it basically yeah yes all right we any more questions we are one minute i hope you enjoy it i think uh, we we really like uh, graphql uh, for this uh, the, the power of it i think a lot of companies like the power of it 
But of course, a lot of companies are uh, afraid of exposing uh, those API. And I think that's, that's an important message to say that we have now the, the technology and um, in, uh, implementation in order to, to offer this, uh, this uh, new, uh, new feature. Yeah, well, it has it has certain trade offs, right? But for for some use cases, it's quite quite powerful and quite quite useful, I would say. But I don't believe there is a uh, any technology as a sim uh, there is a no technology that can act as a silver bullet, right? So it has certain advantages for some use cases, but it's not a replacement for for rest at, at, at all. It just has a its unique subset of of cases it fits good for. Good. If no more question, again, sorry for the limit implement, uh, implemented and enforced by API Connect. It was indeed working. <laughs> uh, it, it, was, it was just the Murphy's law. So. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Say, thank you all. Thanks. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye.